In this lecture, we're going to talk about parallel architectures. This is part of the third phase of the module. We're looking at particular styles of architecture that exist out there in the real world. We've gone through all the theory of how, how to build a computer. We've looked at small architectures in embedded systems. Last week, we looked at contemporary desktop-style architectures and smart computing-style architectures. Um, this week is going to be about much bigger, more powerful computers. So par parallel architectures includes your GPU doing a lot of things all at the same time, not only to render graphics, um, but to, to do general purpose computing now as well. Um, it also includes really large supercomputers um, known as high performance computing or HPC. So we'll, we'll see some systems that are a bit beyond what you're probably used to in your home. Okay, last, last week we were looking at modern computers that you might have hands-on experience with. Um, this is going to go into big high performance stuff. So. Parallel computing is a large topic. We need to structure it somehow. Um, there are lots of different styles of parallelism. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about how to think in terms of parallel computing, if you're used to doing serial programming. And then we'll, we'll break down parallelism um, according to this taxonomy. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about what is known as low-level parallelism. That means parallelism that is invisible to the programmer. So you might already have some of this in, in your um, desktop computer. We'll talk about what is called SIMD, or um, single instructions running on multiple data. That requires some input from the programmer. And then we'll talk about MIMD, multiple instruction, multiple data. That requires a lot of thinking from the programmer. And then finally, we'll talk about new ideas in instruction-less parallelism. This is more of a research topic. Um, that I'm currently involved with, which is building computers that are so parallel they don't even have a CPU at all. So why has it become important to think about parallel architectures at all? For, for a long time, we didn't. For a long time, parallel architecture was considered an esoteric research topic suitable for MSc classes and PhD students rather than for undergrads. Um, this has all changed now, and we have to think about parallelism very fundamentally, including here in the first year class. So, part of this serial thinking has been inflicted upon us for almost a hundred years now by what, what is, in my, my opinion, one of the very worst moments of computing history. Um, and it's a, a theoretical model sitting here in the lowest circle of hell um, known as the Turing machine. This, this is a, a model in, invented by Alan Turing, um, never really intended as a model for practical computer design at all, but in, intended for other purposes, intended for doing theoretical mathematical reasoning um, about the meaning of numbers and about the, the definition of the real number system, which is what Turing actually did and actually contributed to our field. Um, it was never supposed to be inventing the computer. It was never supposed to be a plan for a physical way of building architectures. Okay? It was a, a pu purely theoretical construct. Um, but it has become very influential, and for almost 100 years now, it's been taught to computer science students as the model of computation. And that has inflicted our thinking, and it's inflicted our architectural thinking, and made us think of everything in computer science in terms of series of operation. A program is a series of instructions that are executed one at a time. So this, this is a modern physical model of, of Turing's machine. Again, this, this was never supposed to happen, right? This was supposed to be a, a purely theoretical model. But the, the idea of the Turing machine is that it is, it is one possible abstraction of what a computer does or, or can do. There, there are many ways to build models of computers. And Turing's machine is designed to be as simple as possible for his purpose of understanding the real number system. T Turing's machine roughly consists of a, a long paper tape. In the theoretical model, it is an infinitely long piece of paper tape, uh, which can have zeros and ones written on it. 
Um, it has a head which can read and write to the tape. That means you have to shuttle the tape backward and forward. It is not a RAM because it is not random access. You have to shift it back and forth and it takes you longer to go far on the tape. Um, and it has some logic inside um, what is formerly known as a finite state machine, which is a set of rules for looking at what's on the tape, thinking about it, and writing something else on the tape, and then deciding how to move the tape left and right. So it's important to realize this was proposed about well, exactly 100 years after the analytic engine. If you, if you believe the 1836 version of Babbage's engine, that gives you these two big dates in computing history of 1836 and 1936. So not, not a hugely original idea coming 100 years after Babbage's analytical engine. Um, and also 45 years after IBM had been selling commercial uh, punch card big data analytics systems. Um, but e even for theoretical computer science, it came several months after another model of computing um, by Alonzo Church, the definer of what we now call a church computer. Um, church proposed the lambda calculus as an alternate, and in my opinion, better model um, of what computation actually is. So this Turing machine it was perfectly good for Turing's actual genius mathematical work, okay? T Turing did not invent the computer. It had been around for a long time, at least in theory, um, before Turing's also in theory work. What he did was he redefined the real number system. He gave a new concept of what it means for something to be a number. Um, and he defined mathematics or arithmetic um, in terms of computation, rather than in the other ways that have been proposed by the pure mathematicians. So this was very theoretical work. It was never intended to be implemented um, or programmed or built. Um, but to prove the theory, it was fine to consider the simplest possible model of computation that could be as inefficient as you like, because in theoretical computer science, it doesn't usually matter how long a program <laughs> takes to execute. It just matters whether or not you can compute something. So this theoretical machine design, it's, it's clearly a serial machine, right? It's, it's looking at one point at a time on the paper tape, and it, it can physically only look in one place. And if it wants to do something else, it has to later go and look at that other part of the tape and do something there. So there's, there's no obvious way to, to turn this into a parallel computer at all. You're fundamentally running a serial program as a sequence of commands or instructions. Um, again, that makes the mathematics very easy. It's often, well, always, it is more difficult to think in terms of doing stuff in parallel, doing many things at once. H humans tend to prefer serial thinking. And so this serial design made that mathematics very easy. Um, the, the problem is that this theory has been studied now by several generations of computer scientists as, as the foundation of our subject, um, and that has influenced architecture, and it's influenced how we do our practical real-world programming. And so mo most of us have, have probably even now been brought up to think that this is what programming is. It's creating a series of instructions that run one after another. Um, and this, this style of thinking has led us down certain paths, right? It's led us down the path of assembly languages. That's led to C and C++ and to these huge, complex CISC architectures. And then to all these security vulnerabilities which result from them all. We talked about melt meltdown and spectra last time, arising from this over-complexity of architectural designs. Um, and these, these styles of languages also create security holes all over at the software level. Every time you d download a security update, it's because someone has used assembly or probably C, and these are languages which allow you to leave holes, places where programs can come and attack your memory. Um, and, and do very bad things to your architecture. If we'd have built our theory of computer science on different foundations, we could have ended up in a very different world. And maybe we are going to have to start doing that pretty soon. So it must...
most of us, when we show up in primary school for le lesson one in computer programming, you know, before you even go on Scratch, you normally get a short lesson from your teacher which says programming is a bit like cooking, and they give you a recipe. Yeah? Most, mo most people are already familiar with following a set of instructions. So step one, chop the vegetables. Step two, boil the water. Step three, chop the chicken. Yeah? And then we introduce the idea of programming as a generalization of that. This is a program for making chicken soup. But if you have other kinds of instructions, say for adding numbers together or for drawing graphics in a video game, um, that gets you into other types of programming. Um, this is a perfectly good way of making chicken soup for one. If you are a solitary individual computer scientist, as many of us tend to be, um, and you want to make chicken soup for yourself to eat in front of your TV dinner, um, this is an absolutely fine way of making chicken. But it doesn't scale to industrial cooking in this case. If you are a head chef of a major restaurant, you cannot do cooking like that. You have to think right from the start in terms of teamwork and in terms of working together, multiple people doing multiple things all at the same time and scheduling those people's time to make the soup in the most efficient way. And when, when you guys do your group projects in the second year, you will get thrown into that kind of environment in terms of programming. That comes as a massive shock to many computer scientists. If you're used to hacking stuff late at night in your bedroom by yourself, and now you have six other people on your team who you have to coordinate with, and you don't always know what everyone is doing, and your work has to fit together, there's a whole new set of skills that you have to learn. Um, and so a, a, a top chef will think in terms of this kind of management theory. This, this chart is known as a Gantt chart. It was developed by the management consultant um, Henry Gantt. And most, most basically it's just a way of showing what everyone is doing at every point in time. Here's all the different ingredients in that recipe and we're showing where they can be processed. If, if you've ever played the video game Overcooked, anyone, anyone played Overcooked? Yeah. Um, you, you will understand how difficult this is. You've got to run around and coordinate many people chopping things and boiling things all at the same time. And there are good algorithms that exist for optimizing these kinds of plans. If you have a big list of all the work that needs doing and a list of what depends on what, so you can only put the chopped tomato in the pan after you've found the tomato and chopped the tomato. So there's a se sequence of dependencies. If you have all that information available, there are really good algorithms, and it's very good computer science understanding this, that these algorithms will automatically schedule the most efficient way of organizing the work. And so rather than having one lonely computer scientist making a TV dinner for one, one thing at a time, you've got a whole team of people all doing stuff at once in the, the optimal sequence to get the job done massively faster. So, the, the theory of this, for, for human scheduling, it's known as management science, okay? But the, the same algorithms are equally applicable to parallel computation and to, to parallel architecture design. Um, they used to be used, okay? We, we talked earlier in the module about how computer used to be a human job title. So Bletchley Park didn't only use machines for computing, it had humans. This, this isn't Bletchley Park. It was secret. There aren't many photos, but it's a, a similar organization in another company. You can see this is the computing division. Here are the computers sitting at their desks. Here is the programmer, also known as the manager. Um, and the manager is coordinating the arithmetic. The, the computers are doing arithmetic processing. They're, they're each a small parallelized arithmetic logic unit. And the manager is programming them to collectively perform an enormous mathematical calculation. So, a hundred years ago, this, this form of management science could have become the basis of computer science theory, and it would have been an inherently parallel, parallelized subject right from the start. So it's a historical accident that we ended up building so much of our theory on top of the serial Turing machine when we already had a, a good parallel 
foundation here. This, this could have been formalized, in, indeed it was formalized, but, but not as widely taken up as the Turing machine. It, it was formalized into an alternate theory of fundamental computation by Alonzo Church just before Turing published his Turing machine, several months before in the same year of 1936. It was formalized into Church's theory of the lambda calculus. So you, you might have seen people with this symbol um, stuck on the back of their laptops if they want to show that they like this style of programming and this style of thinking. Um, it's also used by players of the video game Half-Life to represent radioactive decay. But he, here it's being used to represent Church's lambda calculus and this style of what, what is now called functional programming um, or inherently parallel style or parallelizable style programming. This this symbol, lambda, it, it means function. It's roughly the equivalent of the word def in Python um, or the word function or subroutine or um, method in some other languages. Um, it's used to define functions that look like this. Here we're defining a function f as being the function which takes two inputs, x and y, and it returns the sum of them. So this is an addition function. Um, Unlike Turing, it's less obvious how you turn this into a physical machine. Okay, the Turing machine caught on because it's, it's very easy to draw a picture of what a physical instantiation of a Turing machine looks like, or, or to build a physical model like the one we just saw. Um, Church's theory is more of a plan for scheduling computation. It, it would be equal, equally applicable to scheduling the work of a bunch of human computers. And roughly it tells you how you take a large computation written in this lambda calculus and it tells you how you can split it up into smaller pieces which are inherently parallelizable. So you could get one team of human computers to go and figure this bit out and another team to figure this bit out and then you're going to combine the results at the end um, to, to get you the answer. And that there's a fundamental theorem of lambda calculus known as the church Rosser theorem which tells you how you can do this parallelization. It, it basically gives you a lot of freedom in how you order the parallel work and how you, how you can package up that work and give it to different human or physical computers and then combine it all back together and get the same answer. If you're interested in Turing machines and lambda calculus and the difference between them, um, see my other lectures on logic and computation where we go into all the fundamental theory um, of computer science. So, maybe this is coming back in now, okay? This, this used to be a very academic area, and people in industry used to laugh at us for pushing it, uh, and they all went off and did their serial computing. Now, when you show up at industry conferences, you're starting to see these Lambda stickers on the backs of people's laptops, and there's a movement to make things more like this and away from serial computing. Um, and the reason for that is the end of Moore's Law. We've talked about how we've been making transistors smaller and smaller over the decades. We can still fit more and more transistors onto a chip. Um, so as of the, the 2020s, we're now into hundreds of billions of transistors here sitting on a, an Apple M1. So we can still fit more and more transistors on a chip, but unlike most of computer history, we can't clock them faster and faster anymore. So Mo Moore's Law used to have two assumed to be equivalent forms. Moore's Law used to say you can keep putting more transistors in the same space and also you can keep clocking them faster and faster. And it, it was assumed that as the transistors got smaller, that would make all the electronics smaller, it would make the circuit able to run faster and therefore you could just keep ramping up the clock. Um, however, fundamental physics comes into play. Um, and we all have to think about energy and sustainability now much more than we used to. That includes the energy consumption of our computing devices. And that there's this fundamental equation which relates the power usage to the capacitance, the voltage, and the frequency um, of, a, of a digital logic system. And you can see as, as the frequency increases, that's the clock, the power increases. And so if Moore's law for clock speed had continued the way it had gone until the, the 2000s, 
we would have projected this line here in, in terms of power density. That's equivalent to the heat being emitted. It's also equivalent to how, how much energy you're taking out of the, the national grid or whatever you're plugged into. Had that continued over the last 20 years, we'd have we'd have been able to fry eggs on our CPUs. That That is possible on a modern CPU, but it would have kept going. We'd have hit the, the temperature of a nuclear reactor, a rocket nozzle, um, and, and, and even perhaps the surface of the sun by now. So ob obviously this, this could not have happened. So what actually happened was that dur during the two 2000s, early 2010s, we saw this diversion between the two versions of Moore's Law. We've seen transistor count is still rising. But the clock rate has just hit a plateau. We've hit about three and a half gigahertz, and it's not going to get any higher than that. We, we could clock chips higher than that, but they would just get so hot that it would be impractical. Yeah, there, there, there are cases where people do water cooling or other kinds of cooling that can get you a little bit, but it's, it's never going to get much beyond that because of the fundamental law of physics. Um, and so what, what this means is that we now have loads and loads of transistors available on our chips. So look, in, in the 1990s, we, we had millions of transistors. Now we've got hundreds of billions of transistors, okay? We can do loads and loads more stuff, but we can't do it faster. We have to make use of these transistors in parallel. We've got to find other things for them to do to keep everything occupied and in use and efficient. And that's really driving this need now to think fundamentally in terms of parallelization, both, both at the architectural level and then at the programming level. Um, this has to be the future of computing. Um, until very, very recently, this was esoteric graduate school stuff, and undergrads would never think in terms of parallel programming. You are the first generation of computer science students who have to deal with this. Okay? This is going to be your world. You are going to exist in this fundamentally parallel world, and you're going to have to figure out how to operate there, um, which is going to be really hard because most of the people teaching you don't understand it either because we weren't taught how to think in terms of, of parallel computing. So later in your studies, you'll get exposed to parallel software development, but to understand how to actually do that, you're going to have to understand the architectural hardware level. You need to understand what is physically there that is available for you to command and instruct and program. And part, part of this is understanding the classification of different types of Parallelism. There are several different futures that this may lead to, and these different futures will require you as programmers to think at different levels. And it's currently a huge open question where that is actually going to be. So one, one form of this is called instruction level parallelism or low level parallelism. This is what you probably already have in your, your typical CPU. And this is types of parallelism which are hidden from the programmer. This, this kind of parallelism allows you to go on writing your normal serial programs, like Cooking for One, and it tries to do as much clever stuff as it can under the hood without you having to think about it. Whereas when you get to SIMD parallelism, this stands for Single Instruction Multiple Data, this means you as a programmer have to think about stuff, but you, you think about stuff in, in the sense of still writing a serial program but each line of your serial program can get replicated onto many data items at the same time. So for example, when you're drawing 3D graphics for your, your video game shaders, you, you can give simple instructions that are going to affect every pixel simultaneously. They're gonna do the same sequence of steps for every pixel. That's an example of SIMD programming. Whereas if you go to MIMD, this means multiple instruction, multiple data. This means, like in the restaurant example with the Gantt chart, it means many programs all running at once um, and doing different things all at the same time. And that's much harder for most humans to think about. So in the lecture, we're going to work our way through those different classifications. Okay? And from a programmer's point of view, that means it's going to get harder as we flow through the lecture. 
So in, instruction level parallelism means stuff that the programmer doesn't care about, okay? Or I, ideally doesn't care about. In practice, it's still useful, as with everything in architecture, to have some awareness of what is going on under the hood. Um, so the, these are things we've actually seen already in the module. This is going to be a, a, a review, but we're going to show how they, they fit together. Um, so we, we've encountered this idea of register parallelism. This means parallelization at the level of individual simple machines, digital logic machines such as adders or multipliers, all, all the parts of the CPU we've already seen. It means building stuff in digital logic which can work on parts of, usually parts of a, a word or a couple of words that are their inputs um, simultaneously. So for, for example, consider addition. Okay, the, the adders you've seen so far are usually running in series. They, they usually follow the same algorithm that you're taught at junior school for doing addition, right? And in, in junior school, they teach you, you start on the right-hand side. Remember, these numbers come from Arabic, and Arabic goes right to left, and so it's the normal thing to start at the right and read leftward. So you, you start at the beginning over on the right-hand side, and you do some adding, and maybe you do some carrying, yeah? So that here, here you've got a carry. That one has to get added in as well. And so you work from right to left, and you do all this adding and carrying, and that gives you the number. Now, how long does that take to run? If your number is n digits long, your compute time is going to scale with n, okay? So we, we call this on time, or on amount of work. If you're on a serial machine, they're the same thing, because as the work scales up, the time taken to do the work scales up as well. Um, and in architecture, we call this algorithm a ripple carry adder. And you, you might have built this um, in your workshops or in, in your own studies. It's the same algorithm we saw in Pascal's calculator, for example. It's characterized by seeing that carry. You see the rippling of the carry. Remember Pascal's calculator, when it goes to 99999, Somebody adds one, and you see each column goes ping, and you, you, you see it, you see it visually. The carry will propagate from the right to the left. Now, that's not necessarily the best way of doing addition. Okay? It's the way you're taught to do addition at primary school. Um, and again, mathematics, like many things at primary school, is taught in this very individual cooking for one kind of approach. Right? It's assumed that when you do a maths exam, you're going to take your exam as an individual and you're not allowed to talk to anybody else. And so the, the whole conditioning of your thinking has to be in terms of a serial algorithm. Now imagine if we taught addition differently in primary schools. So imagine if we said everything in the real world is done as a team, you're going to have to learn to work with other people right away from this early age, and that includes you six kids sitting around a table adding two numbers together. Okay? How could you add these same two numbers together if you have six kids sitting around a table who are able to communicate and are able to work inherently as a team? Well, it turns out you can do it much faster than the serial algorithm. So, for, for example, you can use what is known as a carry-save adder algorithm. You could give... So here, here we have seven-digit numbers, right? Let's say we have sev seven kids sitting around the table. You can carve up the digits of the numbers and you're going to give one pair of digits to each kid around their group table and you're going to tell them to go and do some adding okay so each each pair of these digits we're just going to add together straight away um, without any carry information and you you might have tried adding numbers together like this yourself yeah even in your own head Some, sometimes you do it if you're in a rush if you're in a restaurant if you just want a quick estimate that isn't quite right you might start at the left instead of the right and add, add up some of these numbers first well what you find if, if you do that is that your result isn't quite right because you've missed some of the carries if you're using the serial algorithm it tells you when you have to when you go above nine and you've got to carry the number and add it in the next calculation. If you're doing that in parallel, you'll notice the carries, but it's too late to actually include them because by the time you've figured out this carry, your friend sitting next to you has already added up their digit. Um, and so again, if you give this to a bunch of primary school kids, they will quickly figure out, if they're reasonably smart, they'll quickly figure out that they're going to have to go around again. They've They've done this first estimate of what the result is. 
they've got a bunch of carries and they, they do another round where they pass the carries to the person on their left and that person will update their estimate a little bit. They, they might have to put in a carry. Um, and sometimes it has to go around again. Sometimes that creates another round of carries. And in, in the worst case, if, if you deliberately pick numbers that are going to mess up the algorithm as much as possible, in the worst case, it, it can end up being just as bad as the, the original algorithm. If you deliberately make it so every round of this creates a bunch of carries. Um, but usually that doesn't happen. Um, so you have to consider the statistics, the probability of different digits occurring. Um, usually you will do this in order log n time. There's still order n amount of work. There's the same amount of work as before, but you're able to make use of the fact that you're working together in parallel as a team to get your computation down to log n. And so this, this is probably the kind of adder that you're going to get in your real CPU um, nowadays. It, it's based off the same full adders that we've seen how to make in digital logic. The, the question is how you schedule those full adders. How do you, in this algorithm, you can have a single full adder and you use it again and again to, to do these steps of the algorithm. In this one, you can make use of all the masses of silicon that are now basically free um, due to Moore's law and having 100 billion transistors available on every chip. You can just make lots and lots of adders and you can run them all together like a bunch of primary school kids sitting around the table. So re remember this is the kind of thing that Babbage got obsessed about, right? This, 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 is, this is why he never finished his analytical engine. He could have just quickly hacked up a, a ripple carry adder and been done with it and finished the project, but he got obsessed with optimizing the carry. And some, some of that work is now really, really important. Okay? There's people now going through all Babbage's notes from 1836 and looking for ideas for parallelizing all kinds of arithmetic um, op operations. So, so for example, we, we still don't know what is the fastest way to multiply two numbers together. Can, can you believe it? After 100 years of computer science as an academic subject, we, we still can't prove what is the fastest way of building a multiplier. Uh, and there's still research to be done um, in, in this level of parallelization. So you, you see the same idea, you, you can see it physically in his engine, right? You can see every digit of a number in the analytical engine is represented by a physical layer of metal stuff, yeah? And all, all those digits operate in parallel. It doesn't run one line, then the next line, then the next. The whole lot passes through simultaneously. Um, and then you, you can see that exact same structure in chip design. Okay, here's, here's the 6502. See the structure that this is the ALU down here. These are the registers. This is the arithmetic. This, this, this is rough, roughly the same structure, right? You, you can see the same two-dimensional grid structure. It's the same idea. You've got each digit of the calculation is represented in parallel. Here, here you can see the eight bits. There's eight, eight rows in the 6502 design because it's an eight-bit chip. Um, and again, this, this is all completely invisible to the programmer, right? The, the programmer just says, add these two numbers together, and this, this all happens under the hood at the level of organization. Um, another form of under the hood parallelization we, we've seen in pipelining, and we've seen it in things like out of order execution, and, and some of the other uh, advanced CPU designs, things like e eager execution. Remember, this is the idea of executing both branches. Um, while you're still trying to figure out which branch you're going to take. Yeah? You go off and you start running both versions of the program in future at the same time as evaluating the condition. And then when the condition gets figured out, you can kill off one of the branches and, and keep the others. In, in a pipeline, you're going to split up your fetch decode execute and you're going to have multiple instructions coming through and work on different parts of those. And in out, out of order execution, you're going to take the pipeline idea, but you're going to have many different instructions and pieces of instructions all happening simultaneously. You know? In out of order, you're going to take your original assembly program like this. You're going to figure out what depends on what, like you do in management science, like when you're running a restaurant and you're going to build in as much parallelism as you can, and you're going to use lots of silicon and lots of copies of adders um, and all, all the simple machines. You use up your silicon to try and run a serial program under the hood 
as, as parallel as you can go. And you, usually the, the end user programmer doesn't have to worry about it. If they do worry about it, they can make their programs run really fast though, because you can figure out what's going on there and you can design your program to take the maximum advantage of it. So in particular, in an out of order program, you want to avoid hitting on the same variables close together in, in the program. If you're, if you're gonna hit on register one a bunch of times, it's better for you as an end user programmer to do something with register one and then go and do a bunch of different things and then come and talk about register one again. Um, so that there's certain programming techniques against all of these architectures that will work with them um, in the most efficient ways. But it gets more challenging for you as a programmer when you go to these higher level forms of parallelism. This is where you really have to start caring very fundamentally about what a program is and, and about how you program. So in, in SIMD, this is the idea that you still write a serial program. It's a, still a series of instructions, but each instruction is going to get run on a whole bunch of data at the same time. So for example, in a graphics shader on your GPU, you can give a single instruction, like calculate the, the lighting angle, and then it's gonna run on many millions of pixels all at once, but it's the same instruction running on multiple pixels. This idea has been around for a relatively long time in architecture. It, it first showed up in 1960s supercomputers. This, this is the Cray, the early Cray supercomputer. Um, Cray is still in existence. We might see some of their, their modern machines later on. But they've always specialized in the very highest end um, of, of computer architecture. This looks a little bit like something from the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey, right? It, it's from the same time, and pro probably that movie was based on these actual machines, because it was the, the high-end technology of the day. And so what, what you got in these machines was the idea of using a, a single word in your CPU. Let's, let's say you have a 64-bit word length CPU. Usually, if you do an addition, you take two words that are 64 bits and you assume they each represent one number and you're gonna add them together, yeah? But in SIMD, you say, let's make use of those 64 bits in the word to represent a whole bunch of individual smaller numbers, okay? So for, for example, you could take your 64 bit word and you could divide it into four subwords that are each 16 bits long or you could have eight words eight subwords that are eight bits long um, and then if you have a couple of registers like that and add them together you can then effectively add four 16 bit numbers together with another four 16 bit numbers all in one go and it only takes you the time of one instruction so in a in a modern system this is what it looks like so mo modern versions of this are in your x86 architecture they have names like mmx um, or 3d now or sse um, you, you'll find these in your, your current cpu and for, for, for example let, let's say you have six, 64 bit words you split them into four um, you can do comparisons, equality, less than, greater than. You can do arithmetic, addition, multiplication. This is especially useful for multimedia applications like games and physics simulation and graphics. So ga 3D games were basically enabled by this technology. In, in 3D games, you typically have vectors of... Some, sometimes you just have three numbers. It's quite common for 3D models to include a fourth coordinate. Um, there are mathematical algorithms that become more efficient if you add an extra coordinate. Um, or if you're doing graphics, typically you have red, green, and blue coordinates. Similarly, it is useful for many graphics algorithms to add a fourth color um, called the alpha channel that's used to represent transparency and masking. It's how you make sprites that can be compo composited together um, so they don't all have to be rectangular, you know, see-through parameter. But in, in all these kinds of multimedia applications, we, we tend to find three or often extending three dimensions to four dimensions gives you the kind of representation that you actually need. And so that's why the original version of this was called MMX for multimedia extensions. And this is what enabled the whole load of graphics, sound, video um, type capabilities. You can push this idea even further 
um, and provide extra registers in your CPU that are longer than the natural word length of your CPU. So you, you probably think your x86 chip is a 64-bit chip, yeah? That's the natural word length nowadays. But it probably has a bunch of registers that are bigger than that. It probably has a bunch of registers now, in, including 128 bits, maybe all the way up to 512. So these, these appeared, we talked about the evolution of Intel um, and x86 architectures in general last time. We, we saw how the registers tend to extend over time. And so the, these are what came from MMX and they became SSE and now, now they're called AVX for advanced vector extension. Um, and so at these scales you can do very accurate arithmetic um, either in four dimensions or you, you could cut them up even more. You could have eight or 16 or 32. And especially the machine learning and neural networks people now are, are very excited for using these to, to model parallel, uh, parallel groups of neurons or other machine learning structures um, inside the CPU. This is before you get to, to running things on GPUs. So this, this is almost like going back to the 8-bit days when on, on the BBC Micro, your address space was 16-bit, but your word length was only 8-bit. And so whenever you wanted to manipulate an address, a 16-bit address, you had to cut it into two pieces of 8-bits and load them in together. You used to put them in two registers next to each other, and then you treat those two registers as if they were a single 16-bit register. Um, so it's just a big version of that. You're using multiple parts of your CPU and doing the loads and stores in a series. So you can't, you can't load and store a 512-bit value into a 64-bit um, machine in one go. You've, either at the programmer level or the architectural level, you have to split it up into a bunch of natural word lengths and then sequence them coming in and out. But once you've got them in your CPU, then you can do really fast 512-bit arithmetic on it, if you like. Um, this is usually considered a very CISC-y thing to do, right? CISC is this style of extending architecture to be very complex, both making the instruction set have lots of instructions and also making each of those instructions become very specialist and niche and doing, doing a lot of work. So you, you'll see, for example, that there's a whole volume of the x86 instruction set. Remember, it's a five-volume five set of books, yeah? And a whole, a whole book is devoted to all the different versions of these, these SIMD instructions, right? Because you can see this gets very, very complicated as you think, how do you divide a 512-bit register into lots of different combinations and do, do different kinds of arithmetic on it? Um, it is also starting to appear in risk world, specifically in risk five, but it is, it is debatable whether this is a good idea or not, okay? In computer science, we have a very old tradition of considering things to be harmful. Okay? You, you ever heard of anything being considered harmful before? Okay? So it, it, it started with the go-to command in uh, basic, 1980s style basic programming. Um, there's a very famous paper called Go-to Considered Harmful, where he just argues that we should remove this thing from the language. Um, and it's, it's, it's been a recurring joke for many decades now, right? If, if there's something you don't like here in the School of Computer Science, um, you would do well by writing to your rep or your head of school with an email title saying, you know, third floor coffee machine considered harmful, okay? That, that, that should get you some attention and, and a laugh, if not actually getting the coffee machine fixed, which sometimes happens. So in, in, in RISC-V world, um, there, there's now a famous recent paper called SIMD Instructions Considered Harmful, okay? And this is, this is causing a lot of current debate in the RISC-V community. Should we get into this? Or is it just an inherently sisky thing that is going to mess up the elegance and beauty um, of our RISC-style architecture? So that's, that's SIMD on the CPU, okay? SIMD on CPU is a really sweet spot for things like 3D video games, where you want to pack three coordinates, or you, usually four. Even if you only use three, you get the fourth one for free, so you might as well bung some extra computation in there one way or another. So sp specifically because we live in a three-dimensional world or a four-dimensional world, um, that's a nice spot. Sim SIMD on CPU tends to get you that kind of physical simulation. If you want to extend the SIMD idea 
to much more parallelism, you're going to end up with what is now known as a GPU. Um, GPU used to stand for graphics processing unit. Okay, these, these things evolved from the video cards we saw in early PC architectures. Um, over the last 10 years or so, they have gone so far beyond that that this is really not a good name for them anymore. Um, that they're really, they should be considered, I think, as general parallel units nowadays. They're just general devices for doing parallel computation. Um, and graphics is just one application of that. So if you, if you work with machine learning or AI in particular, your, your graphics card is probably spending 99% of its time doing that hardcore machine learning AI computation. This is what your chat GPT is running on now. Um, and you know, maybe 1% maybe of its time is devoted to actually refreshing the desktop and draw, drawing some graphics on the screen. But what, what you see here is massively scaled up SIMD. So you, you might have 10,000 cores. I, th I think this, this thing has, has about 16,000 cores now. Does anyone have a, a 4090? No? no? No one can afford it yet? Yeah, um, yeah pr probably around 16,000 cores available. Um, and this is all coming from this Moore's Law scalability, right? We can't make it run faster, but we can put more and more transistors on it. So effectively, you've got 16,000 little tiny CPUs that o only do simple things, but there's a whole load of them. And you program these in that same SIMD style. You give a single instruction, like calculate the value of the lighting landing on my video game character, and that gets mapped across potentially all 16,000 cores. And the same calculation gets run on a bunch of different pixels in that case, all, all at the same time. So you, you may have a GPU that looks like this. This is the, the, the traditional evolution from the video card. This, this is something that you plug into an I.O. Uh, socket on your computer. It's plugging into the bus, yeah, all, all the stuff we've seen in the, the I.O. lecture. And you, tr traditionally, this was an extra component that you bought and you plugged into your PC. Um, they've become so indispensable that they then migrated onto the main board. So th this is the same technology. It's the same, basically, the uh, sl sl slightly older, lower power version, but s same idea. It's been miniaturized down. It fits on a single chip, and this can sit on your main board rather than physically plugging in. Um, and more recently, we've seen it shrink down again um, and move on to the same silicon as the CPU and potentially the whole computer. So this, this is the Apple M1 chip, which is mostly taken up by GPU sitting down here. It's got an ARM, ARM CPU um, that is managing it all, but then the bulk of the work is all GPU now. Um, so how, how, however you physically instantiate it, you're going to see an architecture looking like this. In a, in a typical CPU, you have your control unit, you have one or, or maybe several ALUs. So if, if you're doing SIMD on your CPU, you've got several ALUs because you might be running four editions all at the same time. Um, and then your CPU will have one or more, probably about three nowadays, layers of cache, and then it will go out to DRAM along the bus. And a C CPU is optimized for low latency. That means there's a short response time when you ask it to do something. Um, you'll see very complex pipelines on a modern CPU. Okay, so pi pipelines don't grow over time. Okay, lots of things in architecture grow over time. Pipelines, they tend to go in and out of fashion, getting longer and shorter. So some, sometimes they're very long and sometimes they're very short. Um, Typically, a modern x86 pipeline has around 30 stages, but we've, we've seen that length before, and it's gone down, and then it's gone back up again. Um, when you go to a GPU, you see an architecture like this. You've got many, many of these ALUs, right? They're, they're all going to do the same thing. If you ask for addition, you're going to get 16,000 additions all performed at the same time. But then the, the control logic and the cache is shared between them. Okay, um, in modern GPUs, you, you can split them into groups. So ra rather than having 16,000 additions all doing the same, you, you might have, in this case, we've got about eight independent rows. 
but ev every element in the row is going to do the same thing. It's got its own control logic and it's got its own cache and everything's sharing the, the memory over the bus. So this, this kind of architecture, um, it's not optimized for latency, it's optimized for throughput. That means the amount of total amount of work per second rather than the response time for a single piece of work. So typically on a GPU, you start by getting a whole load of data out of RAM and first you've got to get it into the GPU. If you've bought a big chunky NVIDIA GPU in your PC desktop case, that means physically getting all this data off the RAM chips and along the bus and getting it into that card. And that, that can actually be quite slow compared to CPU architecture. But once it's in the GPU, you can then do this parallel stuff very, very fast. And so you, you try to minimize the data loading and storing between the GPU and the RAM. You try and get everything you need in the GPU at the start, and then you cook it. Yeah, You get as much computation going as you can. Um, and this, this really can be like cooking. If you're doing machine learning, you're going to hear your GPU take off at this point. The fan's going to kick in, and you can, you can hear it doing a lot of very hard work for many hours at a time. So un unfortunately, GPU architecture is a very current field. It is largely driven by commercial organizations who don't make public the fine details of what they're actually doing. That is starting to change. So that there are now open source GPU architectures, right? That these are designs that are on GitHub and you can download the equivalent of their Logisyn files and actually see how the architecture works. Um, but for the, the GPUs you go and buy in a store, you probably don't have a very good chance of ever figuring out what's really going on inside. To help navigate that, an organization called Kronos has defined a set of standards for at least thinking about GPU architecture. So if you, if you buy a commercial closed source GPU, it might not conform exactly to this standard, but you can usually make a reasonable effort to perceive what that GPU is doing in terms of these standard structures, um, more, more or less. So for, for this academic content, we're going to study the Kronos definition of GPU structure, because that is public and standard and widely available. When you see the open source architectures, they tend to implement the standard as closely as they can, whereas probably the, the secret ones are doing other things. But according to Kronos, at least, um, you have a single object called a host, such as your desktop PC, you know, your main computer, that's the thing that you as a human user or human programmer um, can interact with directly. And that, that host controls multiple things called compute devices. And you, usually a compute device means a physical GPU card. It's the thing you've bought in a shop from NVIDIA or whoever and you've plugged into a socket inside your, your desktop. So you might potentially have more than one GPU, yeah? Pro Probably not needed for gaming, but if you're doing machine learning, you're going to need stacks of them. Inside each of those devices, so this, this is the most important part in, in practice. So you, usually the compute device is the unit of what you buy, and when you've bought something, you want to know how it works. And so when you open up that compute device, you're going to see this structure. You're going to see multiple compute units. The compute unit is a, a region of your GPU, um, which is doing SIMD. So remember in SIMD you give one instruction and it gets executed a bunch of times on a bunch of different data objects. So one, one compute unit is going to manage a whole bunch of data that are all kept in synchronization and are all executing the same instructions. Um, at various levels of the hierarchy, you might put in different kinds of shared memory. So some, sometimes all the, all the elements within a compute unit, so each, each individual execution in a compute unit is called processing element, sometimes all those elements need to share some memory to communicate, or, or sometimes you have communication across the compute units. And so you, you'll see different layers of memory. Um, are built into this architecture to enable that sharing. When you program these systems, um, and you'll do this later in your studies, um, the Kronos standard terms are work group, work item, um, and a kernel. 
So a, a work group is a group of these processing elements within a single compute unit that are all currently running and processing a single instruction. That's the SI of CIMD. Um, they're all working in, or in synchronization. They're all working together. Um, and in, in, in particular, if, if there's something like an if instruction or a branch instruction, um, they're all going to branch together. Everyone's going to take the same branch in your program. That keeps it in, in sync. Uh, and we, we call it a work item where a processing element is executing on one particular data. And then the actual program that you give to these things is called a kernel. So you, usually kernels are quite small, simple programs. So for example, a graphic shader is a kernel. Um, a graphic shader is a, a relatively small set of instructions and it tells you how to color in one pixel of your video game by following through a, a sequence of steps. And the idea is you, you try and keep it small and simple and fast, but then you put it on the GPU and it gets 16,000 copies all running in synchrony um, to calculate a whole bunch of pixels together. Um, Here's some of the information we do have about the specific NVIDIA architecture. I've annotated it here in yellow to show the Kronos terms. So the Kronos definitions don't quite match what is in the NVIDIA chip, but they're close enough to be useful and interesting. So N NVIDIA give us this map, and this, this whole thing is the compute device. That's the physical thing that you buy in a shop and you plug into your PC, which in ev everyday parlance is, is called a GPU or a, a graphics card. So you can see the compute de device consists of a bunch of these standard units called CUs. Okay, these are the compute units. Okay, and you, you can see this pattern is repeated. Um, and the compute unit looks like this inside. So the compute unit is going to be where we run the same SIMD instruction on a whole bunch of different data items. So the, the structure you see inside the compute unit is to do with these multiple processing elements. The idea is ev everyone in here is running the same instruction at the same time, but they're running it on lots and lots of data elements. If you go right inside the processing element, you can see the individual CPU components. You can see the ALU um, and all, all, all the different simple machines inside the ALU. So you can see there's, there's some additional structure in NVIDIA as well, right? You can see there are chunks of this size called GPCs. Those are not defined by the Kronos architecture. And so we're just going to ignore them because we're trying to view this GPU as if it was a perfect um, Kronos defined compute device. If you go to the physical die, this image was not easy to obtain. <laughs> the GPU manufacturers don't like people seeing the details of your stuff. This, this was heroically obtained um, by an individual who bathed the GPU in acid and removed all the covering and got it under a microscope and was able to take a very nice photograph of it. But it, it appears to confirm what is on the NVIDIA diagram. You can just, just about see this theoretical architecture mapped to the physical silicon layout. You can see there's a bunch of shared cache in the middle. That's the L2 cache sitting down there. And then you can see the structure of the chip is a bunch of these compute units. And each compute unit is made of the, the individual processing element. Here's how you really program GPUs. Not, not many people know how to do this. Um, I've explained this in detail in my book, which you can all go and read about now that it's um, available for you. Um, this is actual assembly language programming against an NVIDIA GPU. Um, this isn't quite what happens architecturally, okay? Uh, again, the commercial makers will always do their own thing, but this, this is viewing a program at a level called PTX, which is, you can at least imagine it as being the, the underlying architecture of all the NVIDIA GPUs. Um, so if you're happy to work with PTX, it, it actually looks very similar to all the other assembly languages we have seen. Okay, so look, here, here are some labels. Look, this, this is called my loop. That means it's a loop. We're going to run it, and at some point we're going to jump back to it. Here's some multiplication. Here's some addition. Here's some moving. Yeah, we're, we're moving stuff into or out of registers. Here's some registers. Look. 
Here's some multiplication. Look, we're, we're, we're multiplying a number by the constant 8 and storing the result in another register. And it's, it's just like all the other assembly languages we've seen. Um, the difference, though, is that this program isn't intended to run on a single core. It's intended to run on 16,000 cores all at the same time, which are each hitting on a, a different set of data. So each one of those 16,000 cores has got its own registers. It's got its own versions of the data but they're, they're all going to run together. So all 16,000 cores do this addition, then they do this addition, then they do this multiplication, then they do this add. Oh, and then we get to a branch, okay? This is where it gets interesting. So the problem with SIMD is when you hit a branch because different parallel runs of your SIMD will have different data values, and a branch says, if something's equal to zero, go and jump up there, and if it's not equal to zero, then keep going in the program. Okay, so how, how do we deal with that in SIMD? That's where a lot of the cleverness of GPU design comes in. Um, what, what is typically done nowadays is the branch is going to split up your compute jobs. Remember, a, a modern GPU doesn't have just one SIMD unit. It has a bunch of them. So you might start off with 16,000 jobs all in parallel. But when you hit a branch, that's actually going to split your computation in two. And maybe 8,000 of the jobs are going to take one root of the branch. They're going to jump back to the label. And the other 8,000 jobs are going to go the other way. Um, if you only have one SIMD unit, that is going to slow down your execution. Because now you've got to compute the two groups of jobs one after the other. You've go, got to go back to being a serial machine and do them one at a time. Um, Modern GPU will give you several of those compute units. And it's worth knowing, again, if you want to do high-end game engine design or high-end high physical modeling or fi financial modeling, it's worth understanding how many compute units you have and how many of these splits it can tolerate before the program starts to slow down. So if you've got, if you've got 16 physical compute units, so there's about 16 of these things on here, right? If you've got 16 of these things, it means your program can split into two once. That gives you two executions. You can split again into four. You can split again into 16, and all of that will still be going in parallel. But if you split again to 32, now it's going to slow down because you've maxed out the number of different things that your GPU um, can actually be doing simultaneously. Um, so this, this is a program that I wrote uh, for my NVIDIA card. It will run on most NVIDIA um, devices. Um, th this is one neuron. It's one neuron from a machine learning network. So if you want to build your own version of ChatGPT, this is what it's all based on. Okay? So they, they, they make millions or billions of, of neurons, um, but they each do rough, roughly this little program. They each take a bunch of inputs, they multiply them by weight, they add them together, they put them through a transfer function, um, and then just massively scale it up. But this, this is the roughly is the core of all the clever um, AI algorithms we're seeing coming online this year. So yeah, G GPUs started out as graphics units. Um, if anyone's gone out and bought <laughs> Spider-Man 2 yet, they're, they're rendering the pixels through shaders. So a, a shader is a GPU kernel that is making one pixel, okay? and it. it it gets run many, many times. So you, usually you don't have enough. Com um, usually you don't have enough elements to do every pixel simultaneously. You might have sixteen thousand, and you might have a few million pixels. So you've still got to run several cycles to figure out the whole image. But that that kernel program is it's specialized for one pixel. It's going to go through all the same steps, figure out the lighting, the texture and then report the color. And they, they all run almost together um, to give you these, these highly detailed renders. You can flip graphics on its head to become vision in many cases. A lot of the algorithms are closely related. Yeah, rather than generating an image, you're perceiving an image. Um, you're going the other way. So when you see machine vision systems, like our self-driving car driving around in the Isaac Newton building, we are running on a GPU. We're going through those neural networks to recognize pedestrians. Same ideas show up in your language, large language models. This is how ChatGPT works. It's a bunch of GPUs running through these neural networks. Um, or you might go into general scientific computing, like 
simulating physical devices. Every 3D voxel of this car model is being calculated for stresses and strains here. And just like with the graphics shader, we divide it into these individual pieces. They can all run in parallel um, on the GPU to go very efficiently. So you, usually when you see a, a GPU cluster in a university like this, you'll see there's a fight. Some, sometimes it becomes a physical fight between teams rough, roughly doing these four applications. Yeah? And if they all have their conference deadline on the same day, they have a physical fist fight outside the GPU.